Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's two o'clock, so I guess I'll get started. Um, I am really excited about our keynote speaker that we have with us today. Um, and I guess I'll just give a brief introduction so that we can just hear about all the exciting um, research that's going on uh, as soon as possible. So um, we are, are excited to have Professor Ursula Eckert with us today. Uh, she is the new Canada Excellence Research Chair for Next Generation Cities at Concordia University, Montreal, um, a German physicist. Um, she received her PhD in solid state physics, so exciting fun fact for me. Um, and Professor Eckert has held leadership positions at Stuttgart, Uni Stuttgart University of Applied Sciences and its Center for Sustainable Energy Technologies. Uh, she's been leading international research projects in the fields of energy efficiency in buildings and sustainable energy supply systems for more than two decades. At Concordia, she leads an ambitious research program to establish pathways towards new tools, technologies, and strategies for zero carbon cities. Uh, she has published over 100 academic articles and has been principal investigator on over 30 projects, including uh, intense integration of renewable energies and decarbonized local energy systems, Invigis Plus around communal net based uh, energy supply, and um, urban energy systems for zero carbon cities, just to name a few. Um, so a lot of work. I'm really excited to hear uh, what you're going to present to us today. So without further ado, um, I'll hand it over to you. And I've just asked you to unmute yourself so people should be able to hear you. Great. All right. Okay, thanks Bianca for the invitation and, and presentation. And because it's a large topic area, I immediately start and I hope I get through all my many slides um, in the time allocated. So um, if we talk about um, cities, we, uh, we uh, let's say we talk about cities because they are um, the main drivers um, of global wealth and um, related to that obviously of, of global environmental impact because that's where the, the money is generated, that's where the action is taking place and where the emissions are, are caused. And at the same time we have this sort of strong move towards um, smarter cities um, which is very much a company driven um, move um, where sensors are rolled out in a, in a large capacity. So we are in a status of um, obtaining more and more data um, from cities. But um, we at Concordia um, think that it's, it's not just about technology and, and data. So um, if we want to, if you think about cities of the future, it's, it's also very much on, on community building and um, social inclusion, more green, green in the city, well-being, and and so on. So that means um, when I came here to Concordia, um, with my background in physics, it was not just me. I started with a team of um, five young um, cluster hires in the in the next generation cities cluster. And as you see from the um, from the not from the faces, but from the um, associations of departments, they come from all. Uh, walks of life, I mean, from philosophy, philosophy over design, um, engineering and biology. That's how we started. And um, my main work in the last year was um, to see who else is working on, on cities at Concordia. And there, I think there's over 70 professors, um, very active in cities related research. And we're just about to launch a Next Generation Cities Institute. And from um, these um, research centers, existing research centers that you see, you see already a bit what, what the scope of, of that work is. I mean, it's not just on, on built in natural environment, which will be the focus of my talk today, but we also have a strong focus on, on the arts and community building and engagement, aging, social justice, and just to mention a few, and then there's a strong um, cyber security and, and computational um, science um, participation. So. I think our scope um, is, is very broad um, and I, I try to touch just a few issues related to, to modeling um, today. I mean, you see on the right, I just want to mention the Technoculture Arts and Games, 
So I think it's, it will be very exciting to model future city scenarios um, using gaming um, technologies. And we're just starting that work as well. But if you sort of narrow it down a bit again to, to urban modeling, um, mostly most urban models that um, you, you find are very much focused around the built environment. And um, we still haven't reached um, standardized um, data exchange or model exchange. And I think we're still in the middle of the phase of integrating all these different domains. And then, as I mentioned, I mean, big data is a big issue. Um, we again want to um, integrate data sets from different countries to make them available for, for researchers. And I think one of the challenges is to create workflows that make it easier for, for decision makers or planners um, to, to model the scenarios of the future that we need. And as I said, I mean, visualization is an important topic. Um, we start, started to work here um, very much around 3D um, visualization, and I'll show you a bit what that looks like. So um, <clears throat> buildings are obviously is, uh, my personal background in modeling the energy demand of, of buildings. But obviously, if you look at the city as a whole and um, the, the carbon balance of a city, it's obviously much more than just buildings. We need to look at um, mobility um, as, a, as one of the major causes of emission. I mean, at least as important as buildings um, or even more important in many cities, industry and the whole waste and wastewater streams. So um, that's actually the scope of my team here at Concordia. I mean, I hired about 35 graduate students um, of all sorts, master, PhD, postdocs, and, and we're trying to cover um, these areas, buildings, energy systems, I mean, buildings in microclimate and waste and transportation. And I'm trying to talk about um, most of these topics in the next half hour. Um, the, because time is limited, um, I'm not going to talk much about mobility and it's, it's uh, also some modeling activities that um, we, I just started personally. Um, I consider it um, very important um, because especially in, in situations like the province I'm living in now, Quebec with a 100% hydro power renewable energy system, the buildings actually, which are mostly electrically heated, do not contribute much to um, the carbon balance, but it's more the transport sector. So mobility is important. So um, we have a team of, of students working on mobility simulations. And as you can imagine, this is a lot on, on data, um, data analysis, um, demand modeling, very data driven modeling, I would say. I mean, for, um, for agent based modeling is a lot of input data you need um, to find out what the origin destination um, matrix, which is one of the major um, uh, information um, for, for demand modeling, how these origin destination um, patterns are obtained. And mostly it's, it's still classical surveys. So, um, and, and we're trying to look at new ways of, of um, keeping these, these um, information systems uh, more actual. And, and then obviously you have some traffic modeling, um, we're looking mainly at agent-based modeling. And again, visualization is, is very important in that domain. And as it's a lot of about data handling. So we have some people working also on um, image detection. I mean, using the many uh, traffic cameras that are around now to count um, objects, cars, but also bikes and pedestrians. But I won't talk um, anymore on, on this transport modeling part. The same with um, outdoor comfort modeling, or microclimate modeling. Um, we need that um, to evaluate external um, comfort for sure. Also as an input to um, building energy modeling. So we have a team um, of students working on combining CFD models and comfort modeling with our um, building energy demand modeling. And again, it's, it's obviously a complex task if you want to um, combine tools from, from these different domains. I mean, it means um, having powerful engines for short and long wave radiative exchange uh, modeling and then combining this as a boundary for airflow um, simulation. So we have a few um, students working with different, you see already multi-languages, Python, C++, 
um, depending on, on the task um, at, at hand, JavaScript for visualization. So um, again, it's, it's, it's a big task to bring all this together in, in an urban modeling workflow. But um, when I talk about the urban modeling and, and data analysis platform, uh, maybe just a few words before we go more into content. And we brought a simulation environment uh, with us here to, to Concordia um, named INSEL. This has been developed for over 30 years in, in Germany and we used it in, in Stuttgart and before in, in Oldenburg. It's, I think the main idea of what we try to do is to keep it very modular. Um, whatever functionality um, the many students or hopefully soon international contributors are going to develop um, should be um, small modules of functionality um, with standardized interfaces so that we can exchange um, data easily. We want to stay um, open for multi-languages. Um, so far we work mainly in C++ and Fortran but um, now the big uh, player, the big game, the big hype is Python. So everybody here um, works in Python. So we, we started to develop a, a prototype inter interface to, to also um, be able to use Python code um, in our platform. So INSEL is basically the, the main orchestration um, engine of the system where um, you sort your, your model, which might con contain um, hundreds of of different blocks of functionalities <clears throat> and so INSO will be the, the main management engine and um, obviously ease of use, scalability is a, is a major topic um, so that um, different kinds of users um, also non-technical users might use the platform. So I mean that's what we started with, we had the, <clears throat> the INSO engine as the orchestration engine, it needs models um, these models can be classically written as text files, but obviously there's also a graphical user interface to construct um, simulation models out of your individual blocks. The brain are these block libraries where um, energy systems, building models, um, wastewater models, whatever we work on um, is uh, stored, tested and um, packaged with a clear interface. Um, and we're working of um, extending this um, so far um, directed graph concept of, of INSEL to undirected graphs um, so that we can model networks in the same environment and, and then make it open to not just exchanging floats um, between blocks but also more complex data objects like city objects. And then there's this whole world of visualization of, of the data. Um, so what we started with is obviously just a small um, small part of the whole game of an urban modeling platform. There's a lot of um, data input, data handling to make, to enrich the models that we have with data and many different data sources um, that we need to handle from CityGML, GeoJSON, different tools. I will talk a bit about this, what kind of tools we're using to generate the city geometry. And then there's, I think, the whole um, a whole work area on, on organizing all the data that we need into libraries, building physics, usage, energy systems, metallurgical data, and, and so on. So I think that's the task that we automatically we access all this data um, we, in an organized way and we want to write these models in, a, in an automated workflow. So that, that's the overall goal. We're going to stay open source. I mean, INSEL was a commercial tool. We now um, make it open source. And the, the goal obviously is to, um, to collaborate with all of you that are listening. Um, so to find new users and, and join us because I think it's such a big topic. We need many people to contribute. And, um, but we will do everything we can to, to make the access to our tools as easy as possible. So um, again, it's another view on, on the whole um, topic that we are working on. And there's um, people working on um, these extraction tools to make um, sensor data available. Um, we use obviously public APIs and 
need to handle databases and third-party software and, and so on and so forth. So let's go a bit um, more into detail. I want to show you a case study, uh, basically a first case study that, we've, that we have been working on um, since I came here <coughs> a year ago um, in Montreal. Um, it's actually in Montreal West, um, but it's called Lachine East because it's an independent borough. And um, as you see, it's a, um, industrial, an old industrial site um, to be developed. And we've been working on that project um, over the summer. So, and I, I just want to use it as, a, as an example of what the challenges are and how we are approaching the topic. So you, you have a site, um, the brown spots you see on the right image um, are actually two old buildings, which are heritage and they need to stay. The rest is open for, for redevelopment. So what we get from the developers is um, typically um, to the floor area to be built and distribution of usage. So, and then we know which buildings are going to stay. So the first task for the existing buildings, um, we, we create or we, we use an available um, 3D model. We worked so far mainly with CityGML, but that's not the only, Montreal has a CityGML model. Um, so that makes available the existing geometry. Um, for, New geometry, obviously, we need to first of all create a 3D model and there are different tools around. And so far, we mainly looked at um, Rhinoceros as a 3D model generator and um, the S3 City Engine. In the end, to give us again um, GML files or different file formats that can then feed into the same workflow as the existing buildings. So. Um, I don't think it's it's wise to just stay in one environment. I, I mean, Rhino has obviously many plugins to do energy modeling and, and daylight modeling, but there's always gaps in, in each of these um, tools. So the, our idea is more to um, let the developer use whatever tool they want. And then we, um, we feed in the outcome of, in this case, the geometry model into the urban workflow. So we um, looked first at, at Rhino, so some um, people worked with Rhino and obviously you can, um, if you have these um, constructed surface area, you can come up with very different um, geometries um, and we wanted to see what is the, the energy impact of, of this first stage, early stage design um, of geometry. I mean, and the nice thing about Rhino obviously is that you can do this um, parametric design, so you can generate um, hundreds of different um, spatial um, setups and and then run the energy simulation and see what the difference is. And that's basically what the, the students did. I mean, they um, used Rhino and checked what the um, performance of um, different geometries, I mean, height variations, but also um, distance variations between the buildings. And what impact that causes on, on irradiance distribution on the neighboring um, buildings and what that means in the end for um, heating and cooling load. Uh, so I think that's it. Yeah, okay. So that you see the, you, see, you get the idea. So um, this is a, is a nice tool for, um, for doing these parametric designs, but again, um, it has limitations in lots of other um, modeling functionalities um, that we want to do. So we, we don't want to stay just in Rhino because other people are working, for example, with the, um, with the city engine, which is a very powerful tool to, to go more into um, detail of a real building design in an urban context. Because you saw the, the Rhino was a very simple model. Um, now we want to come um, from these simple shapes using rules, um, and these rules could be legal rules, um, zoning rules, um, what, whatever um, characterizes a site, you can now introduce rules to come up with a 3D model and you can share um, that 3D model um, also um, on, the, on the web. So, it's, so here you see already the outcome of this model um, looks already um, much more realistic. And I don't know whether I can play this. Uh, some, oh, sorry, maybe I'll do that later if I still have time. So, oh, okay, maybe now it comes. I mean, the, the idea now here is um, to, to generate a 3D geometry and um, 
in, model, in a more realistic way your setup of buildings in the urban context using these um, rule-based um, designs. So, um, so you, you determine the, the usage of the buildings, you, um, you come up with different scenarios, and then you can also um, put up textures, you can introduce trees, you, um, you can go into the real uh, planning um, applications. Yeah, see, now you see the sort of green side, the, the building layout, and you can obviously walk through the city. And, So, um, so it's it's a nice tool um, for especially for um, non-technical stakeholders. But let's get back maybe to the more um, hardcore um, building modeling part. So now we've got our geometry, um, and we want to calculate the the building energy demand. So there's obviously a whole process um, of going from this um, geometry that. I described so far with different tools and um, attaching um, attributes to the geometry so that you can really model the energy demand. And once you've got heating and cooling loads and electricity loads, you then want to model obviously the energy systems, the renewable systems. So I need to go a bit fast because there's a lot of um, topics to cover. So I think one of um, the main things we need to um, discuss internationally is, is how we handle data, because we can imagine that um, if you want to describe a, a city, you, there's a lot of um, information to be handled and there's a lot of different um, modeling tools that require inputs in a, in a specific format. So the data model basically structures this process. And I, I will go through it a, a bit more in detail. So we have very different um, data sources um, um, to, to recover and process and then use them in different tools. I mean, here in North America, everybody's using Energy Plus. In Europe, it was also Transys. And we have um, also building dynamic building simulation model in Insel. So each of those needs more or less the same data, but obviously in a, in a specific um, format. So that's, I think that's the task. And if you talk about the data model for cities, um, it's obviously not just about buildings. Um, we have also Vixies. This is a Montreal bicycle um, system. We've got composting plants. We've got waste um, treatment plants um, and so on. So there's many objects in the city um, that need to be structured. And that's why we need a, um, a data model that um, is organized in a way to, to provide the modularity that we need and flexible and extensible, but at the same time based as much as possible on standards. And, and the data model that we use for the buildings is very much based on the CityGML standard and the application domain extension for energy. So I just show you um, very quickly how what that means um, to create a, a data model for the city for, for heating demand um, calculations. So that means we have a, the city is our um, top class um, with these many different objects um, that we know. So everything in green is something we know. Um, we know the geometry. We find somewhere, I'll show that later, year of construction of the building and the, the function. So then we have the city object with the location. We determine um, what kind of level of detail the geometry is available in um, and then we have um, our buildings and here you see already, I mean, we know the footprint, the function of the building um, while we create the city model. Um, we know the intersection with the terrain, but for example, we don't, normally don't know, is the attic heated? Is there a basement? Is the basement heated and so on? So there's still some gaps in the data that we need to fill later on. Then we have all the surfaces of um, the buildings. Um, we need still to do the energy calculation irradiance on, on each surface that comes later. And then we've got the thermal zones um, of the buildings and the usage zones. And then we need the thermal boundaries um, to with their openings. Um, and again, some of the material parameters like absorption or reflectance, we don't know yet. We don't even know the U value of the windows yet. Um, the same for the characteristics of the openings, um, 
windows for example in in this case so this is basically the data model for the geometry and building physics and this then we need usage information um, we know some it some of it from the function of the building but there's a lot of open points so that means we need now to populate our our city model and add the thermal related info and, and usage related info um, and we do this using um, archetypes of buildings and and a library concept um, so that we can fill the information um, that we didn't have um, when we just looked at the geometry so um, all these informations need to come from from libraries so we, we started with a, a german library um, based on an archetype um, developed by the institute for wohnen and umwelt now we're looking at the american nrel um, physics library in, in canada has also their own system so they all come in different formats so there's a lot of um, data um, scratching scrapping here involved same for usage we um, we need to fill all these um, data sets for, for set points um, internal gains and so on to model the building right so then we need to do an irradiance calculation on every polygon um, of our city and here actually um, that's where the sort of urban context comes in now we need to know the um, surrounding geometry of every building we need to mesh um, the geometry and we need to calculate irradiance on every um, on every surface so we use either ray tracing or, or um, U factor methods to, to calculate the radiance on, on every um, surface of the buildings. And, and then once we've done that, we are back to, we have, we have stored the information um, for every um, polygon. So that means now we can calculate the demand um, for every building independently of the urban context, because we know the adjacencies, we know the, um, the um, radiative exchange and then we can, so we can parallelize this workflow step which is very uh, computationally intensive so i think the, the main message from all this is we need libraries and it would be good if we could agree on on libraries um, internationally um, to to uh, populate our data models for urban systems so um, I think the a good way to go is is using these um, archetypes, um, which basically means um, you choose um, buildings of similar type and and have a library um, with, of construction, um, energy systems and and usage or operation. So there's been a lot of work on how to classify buildings. I don't think it's it will ever be finished, but um, there's a lot of depending on the country, there are a lot of classification mechanisms and also data available and we want to feed them into the library. So in Europe, there, there's been many projects um, like the Tabula projects to, to do this classification. The data is available in, in the US and Canada. Again, there's lots of different building standards and, and data availabilities. And we I mean, slowly want to be able to access all this different data and make it available for urban modeling. So we, basically tried to do a first prototype using the um, annual um, data um, for <clears throat> um, commercial buildings but obviously we also we have also a project here with the National Research, Research Council Canada to access um, the building archetypes um, for both residential and non-residential buildings so I think if you look around we find a lot of available data but we need um, we need to do some work um, to to make this data accessible um, and then organize it in archetypes and also make make it possible to generate our own archetypes for example if you want to simulate um, very high efficiency um, scenarios for for a new site um, that should be zero carbon so mostly you don't even find you don't find that kind of material or construction information in the classical um, in the classical databases, which are basically represent the code, the, the building code situation of today. So we need to be able to generate also our own archetypes using obviously the material information available. And so, so once you've got the archetype, I mean, you need, you need some basic information of such as here of construction. And actually it's still not very standardized. This 
data is normally not always available in city GML files. So in, in, in the Montreal case, we needed to do some spatial mapping to um, because all the IDs were different between the um, city GML IDs and the um, year of construction. So there's also some workflow steps to, to map the geometry with some um, information on, on building attributes. So that's what we can do. Then we need to integrate occupant uh, models. Um, so there's, we have several uh, students and postdocs working on occupancy modeling, both on data-driven models and, and also stochastic models. Um, so I can't go into detail. There's, there's a lot of um, metering um, information necessary um, for the data-driven models. and. That's also something we do. So this is the work of, of one of the postdocs to, to look at um, available um, data um, from both from France and, and now also a large data set with 13,000 buildings from Canada, cluster basically the occupancy um, data and find relations between occupant patterns, um, presence of occupants and energy use as quite a good correlation, and then make this data available for building energy modeling. So what do we get out of this? Um, once we've got all these different geometries, we, we had, have assigned occupancy profiles, we then can do the heating energy calculation. This is a workflow now using Energy Plus as a modeling engine. And the, the district that I showed at the beginning, um, uh, we did different geometry scenarios. And typically, the demand changes depending on geometry by maybe 10 to 20 percent. Um, the most important factor, as always, is the insulation standard, um, which really determines the, the bulk of the energy performance of the district. So there you can have a factor two or three in difference if you go from code, current code, to um, a passive standard. So I think insulation standards is, is a big issue. And we also want to look at um, Im embedded carbon of of insulation. Um, so for that case study, again, we, we check different insulation materials and say, if you increase your your building standard from, from today's code, how much savings do you have? In that case, it was nearly 10% savings if you go to a passive standard. And it pays back the carbon that you, the CO2 that is needed to produce these materials pays back in five to eight years. So it, in my view, it's still very worthwhile to insulate as best as possible. It's certainly not the case here in, in the Montreal case. Still a lot of glazing with, I mean, double glazing, um, pretty bad insulation standards, I would say. So there's a lot to be done. So that's what you get out of these um, modeling um, workflows. And once we've got the demand, we convert it to electricity because here, new districts or redevelopments are mostly, um, they, they don't allow um, gas lines to be brought to the area. So heating should be electric. Um, and so we came up with the total energy demand, electricity demand of 10,000 um, megawatt hour for the district. And then we do the uh, renewable study. So in that case, we look at the photovoltaic potential um, and this, that kind of high density, reasonably high density, um, we could cover up to 50% locally. And, and then we looked at um, energy systems, so heat pumps with geothermal. So I need to come, need to speed up a bit because time is running up. So I just want to give you a short idea of what, how we envisage um, the, the energy system modeling. So we have the load curves, we have a lot of input data um, for the site. We do a renewable potential assessment just using the available surface areas and, and the solar and, and wind and um, potential of the site. And then we decide for potential energy system configurations. Um, and we use a library concept for that as well to populate our models. And then after this, we come up with um, control strategies and the output will be um, obviously cost emissions but also um, demand response schemes. Um, so the idea is basically also to organize um, the energy systems into libraries. It's a bit more complex because here we have component levels like a heat pump or a CHP unit or a boiler. And then we've got system models um, that are composed of these components and which have also some control strategies. So here it's more, the challenge is more 
to come from, um, from a given load curve, um, have some first dimensioning rules um, for the component dimensioning, and then basically fill a template with a pre-configured model with the system sizes of each component, and then execute the work workflow. This is still work in collaboration with our Stuttgart um, friends, um, and then um, model the system and for first design, and then afterwards connect um, some optimizer to, to really um, dimension the best mix of components. So, I mean, in the end, we want, again, a, a library concept, and you see here the status of the energy component um, library, um, which is easy to use for to, to add new components. Um, in, in the back end, um, this is an equal model. Um, you have classes for the components themselves, but also for cost or material properties. So um, I think that's a, that's a nice uh, structure to organize um, your, your libraries, and then you need a workflow to, to write automatically your, your models, in this case, in, in, in the simulation model. All right, and then small tasks like modeling uh, district heating networks or electrical networks. This is, I don't have time to talk about this today. So, and obviously optimizing um, the system. So, so far we, we mainly work with existing tools like HOMA um, to, to model the, the best mix of, of energy systems for that case study, for example. But I think what we want to do, where we want to get to, is we want to stay with our simulation models because they can have also control strategies for demand, demand response and then use an external optimizer um, to change parameters um, in our simulation models. Um, and we're just looking at, starting to look at, at GenOpt as a, as a rather old tool um, that uh, is very well suited to, to do these parameter variations of, of simulation models. Okay, so to come to an end, um, what is missing? I mean, I, I, I said already um, that we have a team of five, six students working on, on transport modeling, and we have also got a team working on the whole waste and, and wastewater um, section. Again, it, it comes together nicely with a lot of joint input data on um, to, gen to know what waste is generated. You need the, the, the number of occupants, you need to know what they're doing, what diets they're eating, and, and so on. For wastewater, you need to know the meteorological condi conditions, the, the system implemented to um, whether um, stormwater or rainwater is separated from um, um, black and gray water of the buildings. So there's a lot of information that you need. Um, same for the solid waste, um, also there's a spatial component to, to the solid waste and a transportation component of where is it generated, how is it processed. And in the end, um, we have, again, energy systems to convert um, the waste to, to energy. Um, so we're looking at different technologies. And then the output is, again, mainly emissions, obviously, um, but also um, generated energy, um, Waste diversion percentages and so on. So it's a, it's also a big task, but I think it all comes um, together because we we talking about pretty similar inputs. We're talking about energy systems. So it's a lot of connection that we want to create between the teams of of people that uh, work in in our group and and connect to um, others out there in in the world. So so we're looking at different technologies for. Um, for um, waste um, recovery and we're also looking at wastewater treatments because that in the end can also produce energy, for example, from anaerobic digestion or, or new technologies like microbial um, fuel cells and so on. So, and just to give you one um, glimpse of what the outcome is, and we looked at the energy generation from just from anaerobic digestion using um, black water from the buildings and kitchen waste, and we could generate about 100 kilowatt hour per capita and year for that site, and that's 1,000 megawatt hours per year. So it's not so bad, actually. It's, it's about 10% of our total consumption if it's a high efficiency site. All right, so that was my um, presentation. I think it's it's very necessary to integrate um, building modeling um, with energy system modeling that has been ongoing 
in, in this community, especially for a long while, but I think we also need to connect the waste and wastewater and transportation uh, streams because then we can have really integrated um, concepts for, for cities. Um, I think the data modeling part and, and library organization is, is pretty central to the concept and it would be good to, to start collaborating on this um, internationally. And we chose to be um, a sort of multi multi-language open source platform um, to orchestrate all these microservices and that allows us to flexibly combine many different models and not stay just in our own world and I think the main the main um, condition for this is to have very clearly defined interfaces um, that are well documented to to allow others than our team to access the modeling capabilities all right that's it from my side thank you for listening Thank you. That was great. I mean, the whole city in a model, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> um, but really, really interesting. So we'll have time to take questions from the audience. So if you want to ask a, verbally ask a question, you can raise your hand. Clarice is already there. Um, and if you want to ask a question written, you can use the Q&A box. So I will go ahead and get started and let Clarice ask her question. Thank you, uh, Ursula, for your uh, great presentation and big overview of the whole structure of the lab and, and, and how to integrate the multi-domain models. Uh, I have a question. When you talk about, I'm not familiar with the Intel platform, but when you talk about integrating different domains, how do you gauge the domains in relation to each other or if, if that's the case or if that's not the case how do you coordinate that modeling because for example let's say you are in a complex urban environment you have like waste waste uh, uh, treatment where you have also transportation issues you might have energy issues at some stages you have to say well i have i have to give priority to this domain over that domain or you know priority to certain decisions in this domain in relation to decisions in the other domain so how do you negotiate that because normally if you think about that as a, a set of stakeholders that would be a negotiation process so how do you establish this negotiation process that's that's what i was curious from from your work well yeah it's a complicated question i mean i i, I think First of all, I think we, what we try to do is model scenarios of the entire system. And, and I see the sites, I mean, they're, they're spatial sites, so they have some boundaries um, and they have um, people, buildings and other objects on, on that site. So basically we look at, um, and that's what we did um, during the this summer project, we, we looked at all these different domains uh, First of all, pretty independently. So the waste people modeled the waste streams, modeled the waste to energy. Um, and I mean, I think the main thing is to organize input and output data well. So they, they obviously were supposed to use exactly the same um, input data than the other teams. So meaning where is where are the, the sources um, spatially distributed? Um, same for the transportation people. They, I mean, to find out what kind of distances people move, you need to know the usage of the building and need to say, I mean, from that kind of um, building, um, people normally have so many meters to, to walk or, or cycle or whatever <clears throat> to the next um, school or commerce. And so, and so, so everybody um, models their, their system and um, then there's obviously integration issues. So if you um, plan for transportation, electric, the placement of electric charging stations, you need a model of an electrical low voltage electric um, network model. You need to know how much um, load is coming from the, the building sector, mainly heat pumps, for example, and where you have still enough capacity to put charging stations. And at the same time, where also the, they are well placed so that people can access it easily. So I see, in a, in a way, I don't, by, by coming up with different scenarios and, and showing how these different areas interlink in terms of, I would say, in terms of energy terms, and there's 
multiple couplings between the, the electrical and, and thermal network. And for me, waste is also mainly interesting for the waste to energy stream. I think we can model these, at least the energy interactions and, and show if you, if you do this um, waste to energy or wastewater to energy um, on site, instead of pumping the sewage to the next big plant, which is 30 kilometers away, um, you, you can have some local generation that can stabilize your grid and at such and such a cost. And in the end, I think what, what we, the results of what that means in terms of um, performance and, and cost, that's what we present to the real estate people who in the end, and obviously the mayor and community groups and so on, um, and they make the decisions. So I, I think for me, the way to go is to come up with um, realistic scenarios and different scenarios <clears throat> to show what, what the potentials are. And um, yeah, I think th that's, that's the main task to, to show the interlinkage between the different systems and make um, decision makers aware if you make a choice in, in mode of transportation or, or placing the tram station somewhere, somewhere else, um, what, what that means in terms of, of the, the energy concept of the district we are looking at. So, I mean, I'm just talking about energy because that's where I feel most comfortable. I mean, there's other people who talk about um, um, well-being and the socioeconomics and, and more the sort of softer people-related um, issues. Uh, but so far, I'm, I'm mainly trying to set up a, a modeling framework for, for energy-related or, or, or CO2-related um, interactions. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have another question, a written question. Um, uh, sorry, it's a complex question. <laughs> so how it's around how you evaluate the accuracy of the models. And, and that's a question that um, I wanted to pose to you as well. Um, but since you have different domains, um, they might require different levels of accuracy, dif use different kind of met, uh, error measurements. So how do you rectify that? And, and, and I'm going to throw my question in there as well, which is, you know, how, how do you even deal with, with accuracy um, or um, validation more realistically um, across all of these different platforms and different spatial and time scales? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in, in, in terms of the, the building sector, it's basically classical calibration methods using monitoring data in the case of existing districts. I and mean, that's how we started here. Um, it's actually pretty difficult, as, as in many places, to get access to monitoring data because the, there's a sort of monopoly here, um, uh, energy supplier, and there's, it, it's hard to get reliable data um, but um, so we, we, we calibrate the building energy models um, using measured consumption I mean for residential but also we started to work on our own campus buildings and obviously large pretty complex buildings in, in the downtown area so we use the, the monitoring data to calibrate the building models I think that's nothing new um, for, for the building sector um, transportation is is quite a challenge as i said i mean the, the all transportation models so far are based on these um, origin destination matrices which are they are taken they do service here every five years so it's it's for start not very accurate it's it's very sort of macro scale um very little information on i mean there's there are these sort of matrices where they question people what they do what how they move and so on um, not very, uh, not at all, real time and not, um, so not very spatially resolved. So I think the way we want to go, and this, I, that's what, why I showed this sort of traffic camera counting um, at the beginning. So we, we use whatever urban data is available to, um, to calibrate the models. So we, we really intend to, I mean, we have already um, algorithms um, to, to extract um, data from, actually, this is actually public publicly available data here in Montreal from um, traffic cameras and, and just count the objects. And that's used for modeling the, the transportation um, transportation models. Um, 
Yeah, occupancy, occupancy is the same. I mean, there's some people looking at Wi-Fi signals. Um, I mean, I think we need to do whatever we can to to um, calibrate the models for for microclimate. Obviously, we use um, um, there's quite a few weather stations now because even here in in Canada, they're worried about um, heat islands. So it's a lot of measurements going on now on on microclimate. So and we have that data available to 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 calibrate the, the microclimate models. Yeah, it's a big data collection and data processing task to, to become more and more realistic. But I think it, it's, it's going this way because data is becoming more easily available. And so, it, I, but I still like um, to have this gray box approach because I mean, doing everything here, Montreal is an AI city, so everybody loves AI and nobody wants to do physical modeling anymore, um, especially not the students. But I think that's wrong because um, it, it gives away um, knowledge that we have on the built environment. And also, I think it, it doesn't allow us to model more disruptive scenarios. Because if you do it data driven, you basically extrapolate what you already have. And, and we all know it's, it's not good enough what we have. So I still believe in, in real physical models because then you can say, well, how do we, how can we go to zero carbon? And, and that's not, you're never going to get there just looking at current trends and, and doing data, data driven analysis. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a great point. And um, is there space for, for hybrid approaches and um, what would, what might like, what might that look like and where might you use a physics based approach versus a data driven approach? So I, it's very, very open space and um, lots of interesting questions to to answer and to and to solve. Um, do we have uh, any more questions? Um, it seems like there's no more written questions and no one else has their hand up. Um, so I think with that, we'll um, end the session. So thank you very much uh, for coming and, and talking with us. Um, we have a gift for you, um, and it'll be a, a, a virtual gift, <laughs> um, but thank you very much um, uh, for your great talk.